I work in the energy sector. So I, I'm David Lawrence. I've been in the business, I guess, 40 years. It's amazing how fast it goes. I've done some cardiac Doppler work as an embedded systems guy. I've, I did a year of cable, t cable TV set-top boxes. And I have to find the clicker. Here it is. Yeah, you did. A little spastic. Just a little spastic. I'll get in the flow here in a minute. Um, but other than that, I did a lot of embedded systems work with metering, and I've been around protection relays and all the stuff that you see in the grid. By a show of hands, how many people here are energy sector people? So not too, yeah, a few. That's good. That's good news. All right. So we're making progress, right? In general, what I find refreshing about this conference is all these DCS people. So I did a career with Western United ABB. I spent tons of my life in factories. ABB is 1,200 factories around the world, right? So I love factories, but I really love the grid even more, right? So how many of you guys are cyber guys, professional? Wow. So I'm, you guys are going to hammer me. All right, so I'm here for your help, actually. I was going to tell you what you should be doing, but instead, since there are so many, I'm going to ask for help, I think. You're right. That's probably better. How many are OT? Just real quick before I dive into this. Uh, OT and cyber? IT, then. There's no IT guys here, then. There are a few. Oh, I'm sorry about that. You know, we're trying to do this OT. <laughs> really, we're trying to do this OT-IT convergence thing is what we're up to. So for example, Duke Energy, we're a large company, 30,000 employees. I work in a group called uh, it's Emerging Technology. We are 18 people. We do a little bit of generation. We are really focused on distribution. We're not doing transmission, really distribution. That's where all the action is right now. All this renewable coming in, DG all over the place, how do you manage it? We have instead of one-way flow, you heard Jason talk this morning, right? He's my boss. Instead of one-way flow like it was built, we have two-way flows now coming. How do you manage that? It's really disruptive to the grid. You can just tell people don't join, but we have three gigawatts of renewable inside of Duke. We're a 50 gigawatt company. A little bit about Duke. So I already kind of hit on it. 30,000 employees, 7.5 million customers. That equates to 24 million people. We bought a gas company in the last couple of years. One way to move off of coal is to move to gas. It's better, but we've got three gigawatts of renewable, as I said, 49 gigawatts of normal generation. So we're a pretty large company. Inside of our enterprise side, we have, I think it's approximately 120, 130 people that are focused on cyber and all the attacks that Duke gets every day against our world-facing, internet-facing side of our business. These guys are working on making sure that things don't happen over there that are bad. On the SCADA side, our SCADA system is the control system. It's run by an IT organization that's matrixed with our business units that are responsible for running transmission and distribution in the seven territories that you see mentioned there. So we're also working over there to make sure that it's a secure place. Historically, there's not been much pen testing over on the grid side of our, of our world. Some, but not as much. So part of what our group is trying to do in this emerging technology office is go, what is the grid going to look like in the future? What are the architectures going to be? How do I take some of these IT pen testers that understand HTTP, but they don't really get DMP3 or Modbus and all this stuff, and these purpose-built boxes? So we're dragging them to our lab. We're working with some guys that we know in the business, and we're really trying to hone in on what does it really take to make the grid secure. So here's our historic uh, grid. At the very top, you see some generation. That could be coal. That could be nuclear. It could be gas. That's a hydro, in case, you, in case you didn't know. We have a big step up transformer. Moves it up to 20, 20 uh, kV, 20,000 kilovolts, something like this. Moves it along the, um, although in this drawing it says 350, 345 kV. We move it along the countryside. You guys have seen this everywhere. You know, I could say something really controversial would be maybe in the future. Uh, those all get turned into, um, you know, zip lines, and we don't use them anymore. <laughs> but if there are any transmission guys here, they're going to tell me what a crazy thing to say. That's completely crazy. So it hits a step-down substation, a transmission substation. It moves closer and closer to residential, and ultimately you hit a distribution substation. So all this is about high voltage, low current across the big countryside to limit losses, step it down to lower voltages as you go, and then when you finally get down to the home, you're low voltage. In the United States, you're 120. Europe, you're 240. But you have to deliver current at that point in order to satisfy the load. So that's the model that we've lived with for a long time. It was purpose built to push energy one way. Now it's going two ways. 
So I want to step over to the side just for a moment and talk a little bit about the Internet. I was at an EPRI meeting last week and uh, picked up this, uh, I forget the name of the guy. I can't even see it from here, but it's over here, excuse me. Yeah, Morgan, Morgan Fowler. He gave a great presentation on identity, but so this, the, the source was him. So in 1969, you see how small the Internet was. And then in 73, you can see it grew across the United States, 1993. It's touching Australia, all over the U.S., touching Europe, and today it's everywhere. And it's a little bit of an eye chart there to show what the percentages are, but um, the percentages everywhere are very great. Let's back up one. There it is. So they're everywhere, and then percentages by country of Internet user, and then there are 3.6 billion people using the Internet. That's half of humanity. That's, that's really a big number. A lot of searches every day. 75 million servers, 178 countries, a lot of languages, many political systems. Makes it all very interesting. So then you throw in there this Internet of Things, or I'd, in our space we call it the Industrial Internet of Things. How many people here have a definition of IoT versus IoT? What's the difference? Somebody, uh, give me a difference. <laughs> you raised your hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, okay, we'll continue. Latency. Latency. latency, right. Well, let's take that thought further in the group discussion because I could argue that a home as an IoT thing, I could essentially have an energy management system inside of my home that I would like to behave under security, better security controls, and also maybe latency, but likely not. Yeah. But I agree with that, yeah. So, but anyway, here's a, um, a list of all the things. Everything is IoT, right? I don't know. I think airplanes are IIoT. I think my thermostat is IoT. Uh, VR glasses. Uh, if I'm working in a utility and I'm looking at the visualization of what used to be there before the hurricane came through in a VR application, is that IIoT? I think it is because I'm doing as part of a lineman's job and I'm seeing what the, what the uh, CAD diagrams look like of what used to be there, right? But if I'm doing VR and I'm hanging around the house, that's just IoT. Another point in this is that how many people have echoes in their house? Or, uh, yeah. Do you, do you like the fact that it's always listening? I can be a little paranoid about this. You know? I've only been doing cyber for four years. I'm an embedded guy, but I've done cyber for four. And the more cyber that I do, especially after meetings like yesterday, I don't know if you guys participated yesterday, the second session that I was in, we went completely black star at the U.S., how to bring it all back up after all the lights are off for seven days, you know, and this, this scares the heck out of me, right? So I'm getting more and more paranoid. So I'm pretty paranoid about an echo, actually. I don't know if I wanted listening. What are they doing with it, you know? So there's lots of use cases out here for security, as you guys all know. Um, Cybercrime is a big deal. This is a McAfee slide that says that cybercrime is $400 billion a year and growing. It's currently 0.6%. Now, how do you measure? We can have a big dis group discussion about how you measure cybercrime. I guess breaches and then breaches that turn into credit cards being whacked and processes screwed up and maybe money stolen. Uh, the Bitcoin all of a sudden being yanked and this kind of stuff. Um, I'm not sure how you add all that up, but they came up with $400 billion. And in the United States, supposedly very soon, just the next few years, it's going to go from 0.6 to 2% of GDP. So maybe we should all, especially the cyber experts in here, maybe we should all move over to the, a different business line, right? It's a big market. Yeah. No, no humor in that, huh? All right, okay. All right, so um, this is an interesting slide to me. It has to do with ICS threats that are coming on. My big takeaway from this is... You know, I know the difference between control system and the Internet. The Internet is to bring everybody together, communicate. You need to behave well. It's unfortunate that it's anonymous. Maybe if the anonymity went away, people would behave better. But on the control system side, I would like to think it's a purpose-built network. You understand the flows. You know all the traffic. You know what boxes are talking to which. There should be no Internet connection on the control system. I like the air gap concept. Now, I, I believe that you can't air gap everything for sure, right? No way. And you do have places where you want a demarcation point, where you need to connect to the cloud. You have something you want to do, but you should manage that point, right? We all manage the hell out of these points. But this map, this Shodan map here on the bottom, the guys that, that yeah, DARPA that took this picture, it's, these are 
the highlighted points are control systems that answered, that responded to Shodan. So, you know, to me, that's horrifying. It scares the hell out of me. All right, so now we move to the smart grid. Now, I like this picture because this is the architecture that we're chasing in our group in a lot of ways. Classical structure of the grid is very much hierarchical. I have a couple of architecture slides that I'll show, but it tends to be SCADA sits on top of the world, DMS with a, a state estimation machine in the back to predict what the grid's going to look like in the future, and are there going to be problems, and how should we behave with managing the grid. The controls typically reach out to transmission substations and are not very grand. I mean, they're, they're granular to the substation, but not out all the way to the edge today. So this thing is promoting that Essentially, we're moving all the way to the edge, and we are moving to the edge. If you put distributed generation all over the place, you have five megawatts. And I mean, we have three gigawatts of renewables in our space, right? We have big players like Apple come into our territory, and they come in and go, we're all excited. Yeehaw, we're going to get more kilowatt hour consumption. But what do they do? They build a microgrid there, right? <laughs> you know, they build a substantial 20 megawatts of, of, um, of, um, of energy. And so, I mean, we don't really benefit from that. We, we really have to deal with it, right? I mean, this is a tough problem. The thing I also like about this picture, it's all flat. So instead of hierarchical, we're all talking sideways with each other. Has anybody uh, involved in metering here from the utility guys? I just wonder how you feel about the, you know, the silo of the cash register and that if you wanted to do an application in the field around metering, it's almost impossible to get the data to go sideways to make a decision in the field today. We're really pushing on that to open that up so that we can make decisions, but it needs to be secure. I can do voltage management in the field if I can look at the voltages off all the meters and control the cap banks or hit a volt, uh, voltage regulator kind of thing, you know? So, but today that's impossible. I've got this siloed pipe that runs from the meter through a, through a router up to the head end. I can get the data at the head end. I can do demographic stuff or I can figure out what's going on, but it's late. It's typically a day late, at least four hours. We read meters maybe four times a day, this sort of thing, you know. So I want the AMI pieces to become real networks. But you can picture a world where we have community energy uh, storage and battery, everything's jacking sideways, optimizing itself, running more autonomous. The SCADA system at that point becomes supervisory and data acquisition. <laughs> you know, maybe it's not doing control. You know, this is dreaming way out there, but it can be the monitor you need to look. If it needs to step in and do control, maybe it's only on a, where the human needs to get involved, right? But we're moving the machine to machine, more stuff. We can self-optimize in the field. I believe we can do this. It's going to take a long time to build it, but if we don't start now, we're, we're never going to start. So, uh, this, is, this is an architecture that we kind of have. At the very top up there is SCADA. Um, most of the large IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, the top 50 or so, they kind of run their own networks. Maybe they have fiber, maybe they have microwave. We have our own AMI 900 mesh, ne uh, mesh networks. We, um, we have some old T1 POTS lines. Duke being a company that has 280,000 miles of line, power lines, for distribution, we use Verizon Wireless like crazy. You know, we like them very much. They work with us very closely. Tier two would be sort of the substation view, and then at a lower level, we have stuff along the feet, or tier three. And the reason I put that blue dot up there is because in Mount Holly, North Carolina, I'm going to show you a picture of it in a second, we built a microgrid. Inside of that microgrid, we have battery, we have PV, we have a bunch of inverters, we have load bank, we have load, we have all these guys, all these actors. And what's happening in there, that blue pipe represents a bus. We, if you know an enterprise service bus, we took it to the field, and we put it in the middle, and those guys hanging off of that thing, all those actors, they talk to each other and they pull off the function. They do the function independently of the SCADA system. Only one box is responsible for giving metadata or results back up. So that's one model. That's a hybrid, I would call it, because it's still hierarchical, but we have autonomous function in the field. Maybe you have this in your ICS space, too. I looked at an Exxon Mobil. Um, they, they showed me some of their architecture of the future, and they're, they're slipping in these boxes called nodes. Maybe they have a south side process that's gotten old and antiquated and it's so ugly that they don't want to manage it anymore or they've lost it. So they put an abstraction layer on it. And when they do that, they have an interface to that thing to how to drive it. Maybe they speak, I don't know, something on the south side, some proprietary protocol. Then on the north, in your world, you'd speak OPC UA. In our world, our new world, we speak DMP3 or Modbus on the south. On the new world, we might speak MQTT. I don't know how many of you went to the, uh, anybody go to the inductive, um, Automation, breakfast this morning? Nobody? 
That was the best meeting. Jeez, other than this one. <laughs> Gosh. It was really, really good. Well, anyway, so here's another picture. So this one, the microgrid there is on the bottom right. But it is really, it's a system within a higher level system. And the system above it is really only managing two feeders. And then there's a system above that that's probably managing collections of substations. So we've worked really hard to define through SEPA and SGIP, these two standards bodies that we work with, to go, what is the abstraction layer to this microgrid? It comes down to, it's really simple. Absorb watts, give me watts. Absorb bars, give me bars. Help me with voltage support, help me with frequency. That's the interface. That's it, you know? And it sits there and has forecasting from weather, and it also has, it could have in the future to understand the price of electricity. It may not want to participate. It may island and disconnect from the grid and run on its own, or it could reconnect. So here's what we're seeing in the home, and this is one of my most fascinating ones. This is Brian Proctor's favorite one, I think, is that he's got a home loaded with all these devices, you know. Now, this is probably not true. Brian would not do this. There's no way. So a lot of homes, I believe, have this, this tier, the thermostat, the HVAC, whatever you bring into your house, your LNG TV, they all speak to some cloud service through your router, and they're up there talking to somebody, and you're not really sure who they're talking to. So in my house, I subnetted it. I have an appliances. I have um, my core, which is only a couple of machines that do banking. And then I have guests. When guests come in, the kids show up, they can log in and they can use my router, right? They can get on the internet. So I've got three subnets, but then I put a, a box and a, you know, it's okay box. I put a bit defender in, I'm watching my network traffic. There's a company here, uh, Security Matters, that does this in the grid where you can get in the middle and listen or off a passive port and watch all the behavior, what's going on. We can speak about this concept a little bit more in just a minute. But, so I'm watching the traffic in my house. And you'd be surprised at what some of these boxes want to talk to, their own mothership. So you know, I'm not really enthused about that unless you, unless you manage it. I would prefer to have at least some intelligence, a gateway in my home that allows me to throttle traffic. Maybe it could also be home energy management system. It can do all kinds of things for me. I need, I need Linux containers in a gateway in my house to manage my home, basically, is where we're headed. So that one doesn't thrill me. I hope there are no vendors here that get upset with me. You know this two-tier model? Sensors, cloud, boom. But I do believe that you, know, you can't ignore the cloud. You know, one problem utility has is that we, we're managing the grid and we want to keep it all locked down, but here comes a microgrid that's substantial, a big one hanging out there somewhere, right? They connect on, and we allow that. We do the agreement and all that. But then they manage that through the cloud. We don't know what kind of security model that they have running, right, versus what we're trying to do. So this is a real tough one, you know. We have to figure that out. And it's going to take this group, you know, lots of discussions and people leading these discussions to make this happen. So the microgrid's there on the bottom and the system above it. And then ultimately, maybe that thing is, is yakking it up with a cloud service. I don't have a problem with that as long as you know your points where everything's connected, right, and what's going on and you're managing it. So there's the architecture stuff. So my biggest problem that I have from learning, knowing the boxes and moving forward in the cyber stuff is really simple stuff. It's this guy, I wake up in the morning perplexed, and I go, who am I, and who should I trust? Because today, none of the grid-edged boxes know who they are, and they don't know who they should trust. So I love this quote, with great connectivity comes great responsibility. You hear all about the Internet of Things. Everything's going to be connected. But where's the responsibility? Do you guys know? Who's going to be responsible? It's us in this room, right? I guarantee you Duke Energy is going to be held responsible for something. Something goes wrong. So some of the things we're doing. Now we'll dive into Duke and some of the projects we're doing. So in the NERC SIP world, in SIP 14, we physically are hardening everything. This is a picture of a substation. It's only one. It's a fairly high-profile substation. We are thickening the walls like crazy. We're adding all the SIP-14 stuff, uh, ballistics, listening for certain types of sound that are ballistic type stuff. You saw in Jason's presentation today, little robots running around in the substation. They can sit there asleep. Whenever they hear something, they can wake up. They can run over to it. They can turn and start imaging it. We have cameras all over the place. But SIP-14 is very stringent on a badging system. And only the people that should be there are allowed to go in for a certain amount of time, you know, systems to support all this kind of stuff. It gets very intricate, this physical security, but it's super important. I already spoke a little bit about Mount Holly, and this is the uh, Mount Holly, North Carolina. It's about 14 miles to northwest of Charlotte, and this is a nice picture of it. We took this picture with a drone. 
Uh, a guy in our group, Alex, he, he focuses on drones a lot. He's a power systems engineer. He loves them. So um, he takes these great shots, running, flying a drone around. And he's learned all the legal stuff about what you can do with drones and what you can't. So we have 150 kW of solar at the top. Uh, we have a battery energy storage system. Uh, it's like 650 kW. And then there's another battery right next to it. And then this microgrid islanding switch is really called the point of comet coupling. So the modeling work that we've done is that we took all these actors. There's, a, there's actually up at the top right, there's a, um, up near the PC, the, the PV. There's another battery. There's a, these functions, you'd love to hear these functions. One function is, so the solar's cranking all the time, but the inverter that converts the DC to the AC, it sort of has a peak level. It's expecting 1,000 volts DC. But you know that's kind of moving around all over the place, and it, and it clips. It only gives you a certain output on it. Even when the solar's too high, it kind of limits what's going out on the south side in terms of AC. So what we do is we have a DC bus. We have a DC bus, and we, we capture all that in another battery system. So essentially what we're doing is we're going DC to DC, capturing in a battery, and then when the sun starts to go down, then this battery kicks in and gives you another hour of sunlight, essentially, and it's called a clipping function. So it's interesting, but then you go, how do I secure all this stuff? <laughs> After every time I get excited about electrical stuff, how do, you, how do you secure it? All right, so anyway, we've been running this microgrid for a while. We've done three iterations of it in terms of different technologies and how to interface with it and connect it and make it work. So in, in essence, philosophically, this is, this is the view. So let's go ahead and lay everything out there, yeah. So I already talked about this concept of the open field message bus. So I'll, I'll go on to it just a little bit. And I heard it really again today with this inductive automation group. So the actors, you know, today we're really used to polling. You know, DNP3, I go, hey, man, what you got, what you got, what you got, what you got. Or I do unsolicited where you have a bandwidth and you, you say, hey, you need to give me attention and I poll you. There's lots of different techniques. But we looked around and we said, well, for this autonomous microgrid, we would like to run it more deterministically. So what, what we did was we used these protocols. Well, we went to a lot of work to figure out what is the data that needs to be shared across the PV, the battery, this recloser switch, the meters, all these devices are out there. What does that payload look like? The application layer in the OISI model, the seven layer stack, what is the payload? It turns out, you see the data here. That's the maximum list of data I can just about come up with. It's watts, bars, voltage and current, phase angles, kilowatt hours, timestamp, and state of charge if it's a battery. Really all you need is KW and a timestamp. That's about it. And you can optimize this microgrid and make it function. So the point in this, it's not a lot of data. We talk about big data problem with all these devices. We have a, a problem with a lot of little data. You know? So there's all this little data that needs to flow around. So we modeled that, and we used two standards, Common Information Model and 61850. We yanked these structures, and we put just the essence of what we need there. So we're use case driven, use case thinking, right? We're optimizing this microgrid. It needs to island, it needs to reconnect, island, reconnect, whenever we want it to. What's the data look like? There's the data. All right, so we, we're moving all this data around. Instead of polling and all this kind of stuff, we do publish and subscribe. Some guys publish every, every second. Some can publish every 250 milliseconds. Some publish only when an event happens. So you, you settle up on what that publish and subscribe rate needs to be. Some people publish. Some actors publish. This guy doesn't need it. I only subscribe to it if I need it. The controller, the guy that's sitting there watching everything, he subscribes to everything, right? So we've, we're chasing that. So the payload's defined. The application layer is MQTT. If you went to, the, they had gone to the breakfast, you would have seen how an MQTT broker works. It's all published and subscribed stuff. It's middleware. It removes the point-to-point -point connections between an application and, and data. This data can be shared across multiple applications, which takes me back to the AMI, the metering systems. I want that data to be published and to be able to use it by multiple applications in the field somehow, right? So we're, we're chasing this really hard as a group. Another point in this, uh, there is a company, there's a couple of them. Um, well, yeah, should I mention the names? A shout out is in our lab, we have Security Matters. And this is a tool that I would call, um, it, it helps you analyze your network. It sits there passively, watches the network. Now, the, the interesting thing about any substation of, in 8,000 Ducas, I would I'd be willing to bet this, although and I'd like to be proved wrong, is that if you took a tool like this and you plugged it in, into a, an available port inside of a substation or inside of a microgrid, and you sat there and you just watched all the traffic, within no time at all, you'd find all kinds of misconfigurations. Today, it's all functioning. 
He finds relays, a protection relay, that's doing its job, but it's resetting and rebooting and resetting and rebooting. He finds all kinds of bizarre stuff. I give everybody in power world here the challenge to go out and monitor the traffic in your substation. And if you're building microgrids, managing the traffic there, because I've, we have found so much stuff, because it's functionally, it's operating. When you, pr when you provision it, you put it in the field, you test it, you take, me you take measurements, you watch its performance, it works, but under the hood, it's not behaving right. There could be a box out there that says to the NTP server, give me time, I need time. And, it, and the, give me time, I need time, and this guy says, ACK or NAC, I don't know what you're talking about. And this is going on all day, this, this thing is just there. And it's easy to fix, but I'd say clean it up. Another thing you can do with this sort of technology is listen to everything happening in the microgrid and lay behavior analytics on it. So the next step in a project we're gonna do this coming year is to, to watch all this traffic put it in on uh, Hadoop or, well, a little bit of Cloudera, a little bit of Hadoop stuff, and then run some analytics on it, you know, and be able to say, what is normal behavior for this microgrid? But the whole industry needs to adopt this kinds of things, because then it also has a security component to it. Am I being electrically spoofed somehow, right? So I think that might be all I really want to say about this one. Do you guys get the point on that? <laughs> yeah. All right. Oops, all right. So, yeah, let's, let's go through this for just a second. How much time, how am I doing on time? Five more minutes? Perfect, perfect. All right, so the use cases that we're going into this next year, you know, we, we tend to have this functioning microgrid in front of us, and it's got examples of all the equipment that we work with in our space. You know, we, we have reclosers laying around, we, have, we don't have a voltage regulator, we have cap band control, we have all this stuff, right? And we can glue it all together and we can make it work as a functioning system. But the use cases we're looking for from a security point of view is what is normal behavior of this thing? From an IT point of view, from an OT point of view, from a security point of view, what's its behavior? What does it mean to be normal? What does it mean to be bad, right? The biggest problem we have is this concept of identity. The boxes have no identity. So we're, we're experimenting right now. We're, we're buying gateway boxes, not edge boxes that have T TPM 2.0 on it, and we're gonna slam identity into that chip. We understand the interface to it, this I2C bus thing, and we're looking at the boot through the BIOS, through the kernel, is the kernel secure, and then Linux containers with different applications running in them and how to do digital signing. Now we built this microgrid, we, we built it originally with MQTT, and we understand how to put certs on boxes, if the box will accept a cert, put certs on them and have them work together with authentication and trust, but it's extremely hard. There's no way to manage it that I see in our space so far. So we're working with identity through TPM, and also this year I've got on my plate to go figure out how to do PKI. The only group I've seen step up and looks like they're doing it so far has been Bedrock down here. It's the only, only, only box in the whole business that I've seen that puts security in their box and also has a, um, has a way to do key management. That, that comes out of the box somehow. So I haven't evaluated, I haven't looked at it, I don't necessarily mean to put a plug in for them, except to shame the rest of the industry. Sorry about that, <laughs> you know, where are we going? And I, yeah, yeah, whatever. If you say you wanna patch devices in the field today, it's extremely difficult. Either we don't do it, or you have to drive a truck out there, or if you need to remote access into it, maybe you do, you might telnet in, which is not secure. You telnet in, or you SSH in, and then you run a fat client. You sit in your office and you run a fat client piece of software and you have to work with that machine in the field. There's no concept of work with it in the back, develop a, an update blob, throw it out through the network, have it land at the edge, unravel it and apply it against the device. We don't do that in our space. So we're working on that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of good concepts of things we're working on, these use cases. The self-healing one is a really good one. And then I like the micro PMU. PMU stands for phaser measurement unit. It's the idea that the control system tells things to happen, gives controls, but then on the back side of it, you can put these little phaser kinds of devices, and you can either run them distributed or you can try to stream the data back. Historically, you stream it. I'm not a big fan of that, but you, you, can, you can detect whether what this control system thinks is happening is really happening. That's what that, that PMU thing is about. And then uh, back to data modeling. So my mind is changing a little bit, really, actually, after the last two days here. 
But uh, I think it's a good idea. This, in our space, there's a security standard called IEC 62351. Now, I heard a lot about 62334. Uh, yeah, I, after this, you know, I had never heard of this. I, all these years, I don't know the standard. So I'm going to go read it. I hear it ties in vendors into you somehow. That, that sounds like a good thing. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really good. But I don't think it gets down to any data modeling, right? Whereas my 61850 standard and my 62351 standard, man, they're all about prescriptive data models and stuff, right? So, so in the 62351, the idea is to go in and define for our devices what I would call from the SNMP world, the, the IT world, um, a MIB. We don't have MIBs in our boxes, right? Now, I'm not saying we need to do SNMP or a MIB, but let's say I have a MIB. I define it, but I'd like to just have a, a, a data structure that I publish with MQTT, and I'd call it my, my MIB. So we're going to work on that and define what that thing looks like. We're going to keep exploring uh, you know, what's going on with these uh, pub sub protocols and how to make this work. There's some complexity to it. Some of them work really, really great on the LAN. Some work better over the WAN. Uh, so there's, there's some intricacy in that. And, and again, that inductive automation group, <laughs> those guys are on the right track. You know, if you get a chance to go take, check out, read the specs, read the work that they're doing, it, it's, you, should, you should look at it, absolutely. Um, and then. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. You know, typically, most of all protocols that want to be secure are really dependent on the transport layer. And so everybody's all excited about TLS 1.2. We have OpenSSL. A lot of these pub sub ones that we work with, the three major ones, they, they'll, they'll bring in a library that's OpenSSL. You can do that sort of stuff. Um, version 1.2 allows you to choose whether you want crypto or not. Now, 1.3, I've been told, will enforce everything into end encryption. And as an industry, I don't see us going to 1.3 because... I don't need confidentiality in my substation or in my, my microgrid. You know, I don't want it there. I want to be able to observe behavior. If I encrypt everything end to end, I don't see anything. So, and I'm not going to have some listener in there with all the certs for all the devices on it. I don't think so. So I don't know. I'd like to hear from the group, you know, ultimately in the end here in this discussion, what, what is going to happen? You know, are you guys going to adopt a TLS 1.3 when the RFC group comes out and says this is ratified? Who here is involved in that group that's, that's saying, mm, I don't think that's a good idea in the energy sector or in the DCS sector? And then um, out of California, there's this the SCADA, uh, SCADA Systems Protocol of the 21st Century. They've said X.509 for these grid edge devices and IoT devices are, are too, um, it's too heavy. The stuff's not really used. Now, it's easier to just use X.509, but they're going, I can make this smaller. I can probably have a security model that's lighter that will work with uh, SCADA protocols. So that's being worked on right now by um, uh, Rich Corgan out of stg &E and Adam Crane and others. There's a big group working on the, this particular piece. So we'll have to see how it shakes out. And then finally, you know, back to the behavior analysis. I think this is a key thing. Uh, take your IT pen testers, take them over, and put them in your OT world. And if it's a Linux or a Windows box, they'll make you look bad. If it's a home, if it's a proprietary box they've never seen before, like VX works, they won't know what to do with it, you know? And it'd be a great lesson for them, you know? So I'd chase that down in a, in a major way. Uh, the other thing is, is um, really this behavior analytics is going to be big, super big. So back to our lab again, we're going to collect all this uh, passive data that we picked up from this great tool that we put in the lab, lay it out there in a Hadoop, and we're going to probably work with um, a leading little startup analytics company that can really crank it out, and we're going to do machine learning on this thing and see what we get next year. So next year when I'm here, hopefully I would be either giving a machine learning or deep learning aspect of how to secure a microgrid or a substation or a chunk of the grid, or I'll be talking about micro PMUs and how to use those for security. I hope that's a good one that we talk about. Um, or hopefully the real one is that we discover a way that's simple enough, because I don't know what you guys think about PKI, PKI, but that we really do you know, public key infrastructure in our space and set forward a path. If not, you know, we're going to have this, this bad thing happen. So Duke Energy, this is my dog. She's 14. And um, she's sleeping so peacefully because we keep the light on. Not lights, the light. You know? <laughs> so thank you very much. Enjoyed it. <laughs>